Okay, good morning, uh, Greg. Good morning. Uh, thank you uh, so much for making your time for our team here in Siem Reap. Thank you. And today we are talking maybe different topic a little bit and maybe the second time that our team uh, uh, meet you again. And, you know, many people say that when they come to Siem Reap and they don't have any other staff to see, uh, beyond stone, but I don't think I don't think you agree with that idea. So you you have been here for many years already. So so besides stone, besides temple, maybe you have many other stuff such as food, maybe people life, or maybe I don't know, uh, uncle people uh, livelihood, for example, please. Sure. Well, thank you for inviting me again. I, I really, uh, you know, I enjoy talking about Siem Reap and, and sharing all the fun stuff to do. And uh, you, you're absolutely right. Most people who come here, they don't know anything other than the temples because that's all they've seen before they got here. And when they plan their trip, they might only plan two days here because they think, well, the, to see the temple, how long will that take? Two days. So I think the more... Maybe because of the... It because of uh, advertisement to the world, because uh, they always advertise temple, not the people life, not the uh, uncle people life, for example. This is a really good point because you're you're right. I mean, and the, it's you, you can't fault them for wanting to highlight the temples because there's nothing like it in the world. And I think when any country wants to promote itself, they're going to talk about their unique uh, features, and and so Angkor is absolutely a must. But uh, there are so many other things and people have to understand what other things there are to do here when they're making they their are, planning. What, yeah. So, you know, the, the more that all of us, and I think it takes an effort from everybody. I, I, I think to expect to, to just wait and say, okay, the government has to do it or this person has to do it, just do it. You know, we, we all can play a part in that. And I'm very happy with what we do at Far Circus is, is that we don't just talk about the circus, we collaborate and we promote the destination. We've done a lot of destination marketing activities. So yeah, I have been here a while, about going on almost 13 years. And <laughs> 13, 13, 13, oh, 13 years. Yeah, yeah. not 30. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, you know, that, that's yeah. a possibility eventually, but, um, and yeah, you know, the food obviously is attractive <laughs> and that, which is an, an interesting thing. I don't think the world knows about Thai food. They know about Vietnamese food because I think there's a lot more Thai and Vietnamese who have emigrated to other countries. So you see a lot more of those restaurants. And now, Cambodian some, food. Yeah, but they don't know it because there's not a lot of Cambodian restaurants in other they countries. They don't know it well or they know it less? They don't know it at all. Huh. Uh, you know, unless you live in a place where there's a Cambodian community. So, for example, in America, there's a large Cambodia community in Long Beach, uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. And in those kind of places, of course, there's Cambodian restaurants. Um, but, but here? Well, uh, people have to find out about it. And there's some really interesting, uh, I'm not a foodie per se. I mean, yeah. I eat too much, if that. <laughs> but, you know, you, you have some really interesting celebrity chefs now, like Chef Nock. Oh. You know, she's been written up in New York Times. She has award-winning books. So that's one way that you can get the message out about Cambodian food. And then you have uh, like Chef Sopek down in Phnom Penh at Villa 5 Cuisine. You, you have to eat there if you haven't yet. It's, it's fantastic. So the more that those kind of uh, uh, restaurants and chefs are, are talked about, the more people will know about Khmer cuisine. I think it's unfortunate and it uh, makes me a little bit sad that most foreigners, when they think of Cambodian food, they think of shock cuisine, like, you know, spiders and bugs and stuff like that. Yeah. That's not attractive. Okay. It might be novelty, you know, so maybe when they come here, the tour guide takes them to the yeah, tarantula yeah, yeah. village or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, people who travel for food want to know what the, the more delicious the, cuisine yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, the specialty of uh, Cam Cambodian food. And for you, it means uh, it's very hard for tourists uh, to find out the Cambodian, I mean, the purely Cambodian uh, cuisine? Or? It takes some effort, I think, for, for visitors to really discover the restaurants. And I, there are some tour operators who do... Uh, foodie tours, which I think is great. Um, some of them will take them out to the the um, street food night markets, like on 60 Road. I think that's fantastic. As a visitor, that's a, a very unique, exciting experience to have that kind of food. Um, personally, I, I'm not interested in eating spiders, so that wouldn't attract me. But um, 
things like those kind of foodie tours to go to street food. Um, at Far Circus, we even, we kind of realized that street food is an attractive experience for visitors. You think of place like Singapore, you know, Singapore's world famous for the street food. Um, Taipei, also very famous yeah, for street, street food. food. People don't know that there's some great street food experiences here. So, so back to your 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 question or your answer, it means Nassim Reap has, uh, I mean, Nassim Reap has a lot of street food, uh, uh, has a lot of uh, Cambodian food, or maybe we do not advertise or well, we do not commu communicate uh, to the world well. That is why tourists uh, do not uh, know or uh, it's very difficult to, to tourists uh, when they come to Nassim Reap, find out the uh, Cambodian cuisine. So what what is the point? Well, a I, I, lot of, I feel generally there is yes. an under appreciation for the importance of marketing that you cannot just open a restaurant and expect people to show up. For example, you, you have to get the message out about your, ref, your restaurant. There's so many ways to do it. You can do that with advertising, you know, but advertising can be expensive. You can do that by attracting media you get earned media and people will talk about you and write about you and there have been some great there have been some good stories in international media about dining opportunities in Siem Reap. so that's a great way to to do marketing but we all have to do something to get the message out to let people know about those kind of restaurants it's not only spiders yeah yeah <laughs> so it means that Siem Reap has a Khmer cuisine but the Khmer cuisine I mean is not a communicate well to uh, well to the world no, right. I think we can do a lot better job messaging. Uh, you know, like the, the Kim San twins who who opened uh, the embassy restaurant. Now they have a new one uh, around Pub Street called Amok. Okay. And, you know, I only knew about it because uh, Chef Nak was in town. We went out to, to lunch there. But it's a fabulous place. So, you know, how can we let more people know that that kind of restaurant exists? So not only not only Khmer cuisine in Siem Reap, there are a lot more, uh, I mean, foreign cuisine, which are very special to tourists, uh, domestic tourists or foreign tourists, international tourists. Is it right? I think that's interesting because, you know, Americans are always uh, blamed when, when we go to other countries. We always want to have familiar food to us, right? So maybe yeah, we yeah, seek sure. out American restaurants. I think that's kind of true for a lot of nationalities. So when, when, uh, they started talking about the India market coming here. You yeah. noticed around Siem Reap, a few more Indian restaurants opened yeah. up. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, there's a fabulous Georgian restaurant. Unfortunately, I moved to Phnom Penh, but uh, that was one of my favorite restaurants. Lots of Italian restaurants. So I think for- A French and, restaurant. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thai. Abacus, Thai. Um, so I think for somebody who wants an international food experience, Siem Reap can offer that too. Yeah. For me personally, I mean, yes, I seek comfort food when I travel, but I also want to experience something genuine yeah. and authentic. So food and local. can be for you, can be also tourism product and also that car, I mean, food can be the adventure of tourists also. They want just, they want to, I mean, uh, adventure for, for food or not uh, young tourists, uh, for example. Oh, no, I think people of all ages, uh, cuisine is a motivator for, for travel and how they pick their destination. I think, of course, that people travel for many reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, not some only Some of them food, want yeah. adventure, some yeah. of them want uh, relaxation. But some some, sometimes they adventure for food also, and they try food, you know, because they the uh, Cambodian, <laughs> yes, spider or something, you know, they just want to adventure also, not the adventure uh, on the mountain. <laughs> I think overall, okay, so beyond food, a lot of people, when they travel to another country, they want to experience that country. So what, what, what do you think about when you think about what is a country all about? And food is a big part of that. Daily life is a big part of that. Um, art and culture is a big part of yeah, that. So yeah. I believe that that's a strong motivator for a lot of travel. Yeah. They want to experience the local community. And I think Cambodia especially, when people come here, they understand they're coming to a place with uh, a very rich and long history. Yep. Um, some of it tragic, some of it beautiful. Yeah. Um, but they want to experience that. So the and yeah. So I think food fits into that. I think arts and culture. So around yeah, Siem Reap, there's so many new art galleries opening up, and I think uh, that will be really interesting because you know, of course, uh, you know better than I do. The pre Khmer Rouge art was yeah. flourishing here, performing arts, visual arts, all of that, mm -hmm. and then it kind of got uh, uh, decimated. It's coming back, yeah. And I, I look at that. I'm not an art mm. arts person per se. I'm a tourism person by trade, 
uh, but I recognize that that's really cool. Yeah. You know, that people are expressing themselves and they're presenting their culture to anyone, the public, the local, international, whatever. So, uh, yeah, I think to, yeah. to experience the real life uh, of what's happening in the country it, that they visit is important. Food is part of that art. Yeah. Uh, Talking about Siem Reap, you know, I have observed that uh, there are many seasonal fruit, for example, such as uh, traditional fruit at Uncle or maybe mushroom uh, taken from uh, Uncle's side or something. So there are many uh, vegetable, traditional vegetable, uh, traditional uh, fruit, uh, seasonal fr uh, fruit. Uh, you think it could be a very good product for tourists or? Yes, I think, you know, any any kind of whether it's prepared uh, meals or, or whether it's fruits and veg vegetables found in nature, I think all of that can be of interest. <clears throat> we were out at uh, Kampong Pluk uh, last week for the, the holiday and, you know, we went through the flooded forest and, you know, you're going to see things that are unique to the, the floating village, you know, the... Of course, coconut trees are not unique to that, but you know, yeah. when a visitor goes out there, they can enjoy a fresh coconut. They can see the the fish, you know, yeah. that the, so the, have the locals you, eat. So, have you ever experienced a mushroom from Uncle uh, Archaeological uh, Park? Honestly, no. <laughs> I can tell you, my neighbor is a, a mushroom <laughs> farmer, though. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have mushrooms or growing maybe, right next to uh, our house. Or maybe very traditional uh, seasonal. seasonal Seasonal uh, fruit, for example, from Uncle, from Kulen or something. Have you ever uh, Kulen, yes. Yeah. You know, when you go up Kulen, especially, like, I think they have a very, and you can tell me better, uh, a very unique kind of banana that only grows up on Kulen Mountain, right? It's a very different kind yeah. of... Uh, so, yeah, you try that. They sell it, you know, at the, the roadside stands. That's, but that's those fun. stuff could be also um, tourism product. Well, I think it's a part of the tourism experience, uh, part of the overall experience. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much people will travel just for that. Yeah. But I think if... But it could be a, com a, a sure. compliment. Yeah, complimentary Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. I think, you know, present Cambodia as a whole. Yeah. You know, what is Cambodia about? What is Cambodian life about? And it can yeah. be about food and, yeah. and art and... Uh, you know, now <laughs> I remember when I lived in Phnom Penh, it was just, it was really kind of fun walking along the, the river uh, the walk river, yeah. in the early evening. And you yeah. just see lots of community get together down there and do their exercises. And yeah. uh, the young people were doing group dances. That was back when uh, Gangnam style was really popular. <laughs> yeah, <so. yeah. laughs> but, you know, that's part of daily life. Okay. You know, the dining and th that kind of stuff is daily life. That's what so, visitors so, so want to So talking see. about daily life of uh, people at Angkor, Phnom Penh, for example, Tourists, uh, international tourists, they come and they want to see uh, people live here, for example. People go fishing, people go farming, <laughs> people go, I don't know, whatever. So, so yeah, why, why people want, want uh, when, when they come here and they want to see people live, for example? But that is, that is why people travel. They, they want to experience what's really happening in that country. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, I remember when I came back here, came here as a tourist for the first time. I don't know, 20 years ago almost. Okay. And I made friends with my tuk-tuk driver. And, you know, he's, he said, hey, do you want to go out and see my village? You know, my, my dad's building a house and, you know, you guys want to come out and see the village. And of course we did. I mean, what a great experience to go see a local village, not a touristy place, not something that's built up for tourists, but a place where families live and families have daily and life. You, you discuss a bit of family member. That was member. the highlight. Oops, yeah. Sorry. That was, that was the <laughs> highlight of my trip. Okay. And that's kind of why I moved back here because it was how I got to know people away from a businessy kind of transaction or okay. tourist transaction. It was by going to the village. And then the same thing, you know, uh, I don't know, we came back another trip. I came a few times before I moved here. He said, hey, there's a wedding out in my village. Do you want to go see that? And it's like, of course I do. You know, what a great experience to, to attend a, a wedding that's completely different from our own country wedding. So that's what uh, I think a lot of what motivates travelers. They want to so, have So a, in Siem Reap, for example, uh, we say temples of uh, what the daily life of people that tourists uh, uh, can be uh, interested, in, for example. Well, the, the highlights for me, if, yeah. if someone were to ask me, what should I yeah. absolutely do? I mean, I think something very unique to the area are the floating villages. I, I think yes, you need uh, to go out there thing, yeah. and you need to get out and you need to engage in a floating village. 
Um, we did it by kayaking, actually, once. We went to Maitre and we went kayaking through the village. And then I think yeah. <laughs> we became sort of the tourist attraction while all the locals were like going, oh, look at them kayaking. And <laughs> <laughs> but it was a cool experience. Yeah. The other thing I think that people miss out is Kulin Mountain. And, you know, you, you go up there, there's a... What, what they are over there? Oh, my gosh. Well, of course, you know, the, the most heavily visited popular things like the, the waterfalls and the reclining Buddha, those are fabulous. And I, yeah. I really enjoyed seeing that. But there's the Anlong Tom community-based mm -hmm. tourism center up there that will take people on these, you know, hikes through the nature around their village. And you can do homestays there. And, um, you know, that's the, the engaging person yes. to person experience that that's kind of fun and you know i like to bike and okay <laughs> one one time i went up there biking and i was trying to follow a trail that i recorded from somebody else on strava mm -hmm. i got hopelessly lost through the jungle up there and then suddenly i came out on stradam ray the, the the elephant pond yeah and i mean i get goosebumps <laughs> when i think about it because why why you got the well you know, I, I had seen about it in the tourist magazines. I kind okay. of knew it was there, but to accidentally come out on it from a yeah. jungle trail is yeah. awesome. It was just, and it was, you know, during COVID, I was the only person there. So I just sat there for an hour. And, you know, I think a lot of Westerners, they can't understand, uh, we, I shouldn't say they, we can't understand a lot of the spirituality that is inherent in mm -hmm. the temples and in places like Sra Dam Re and, the fact that that's you know almost two thousand years old, and so we but we feel something, you know. When I, when I go up there, I could just feel something. Looking at those carvings from the eight hundreds, and imagining what the life, how much life has happened uh, in that area uh, during that time, yeah. Oh, and since, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, it's got such a long history. The thing. <laughs> You know, Westerners like to say, oh, we, you know, Angkor Wat was rediscovered in whatever mm. year that the French yeah. explorers came here. And I'm like, you know what? The Khmer people, it's a surprise. They've been living here all the time. Yeah. You know, so life has gone on. And for me, it's kind of fascinating to imagine what that was like. Mm -hmm. So when, when I, I, I still bike the trails in Angkor Park, that's another thing I think people don't know is there. They, they go to Angkor Park, they take a tuk-tuk, they get, stop in the parking lot, get out of the parking lot and go see the temple. But, you know, there's, there's just tons of trails through the jungle. Easy to ride, it's flat. Yeah. And then you come out on the back of the temple from a jungle trail. Yeah, very, very amazing, yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So I, I, if anybody asks me, I encourage them to try that. Okay. So be, be, beside, for example, beside a Kulin, when you go to... Each village uh, in Siem Reap, for example, you recommend uh, tourists uh, to see what? <coughs> to talk to people, to see banana tree, to see uh, Cambodian uh, forest or what? <laughs> I, I think, you know, that's some. this is a hard place to do things like that on your own. I think, you know, there are uh, tour operators or even the tuk-tuk drivers or whatnot that can take people out there. So you need to, uh, you know, we can do a better job of, of uh, making that happen. But there are tour companies that do that. Um, the, this, I'm, I'm sidetracking a lot, okay. but there's a really great book uh, by Elizabeth Becker. Um, she wrote called Over, Overbooked. And oh, over she, overbooked. Uh, overbooked. You okay. know, some people worry about uh, okay. over tourism. Okay. So she examined tourism in, in several countries. Cambodia was one, but France was another one. And like, you can imagine when people go to France, what, what do they want to see? Besides Eiffel Tower, right? So yeah, Eiffel yeah, Tower yeah, first, is there yeah. and Car Wat. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people, visitors that go to France think, okay, cheese, yeah. you know, or um, farms or stuff like that. So the yeah, French, they, they, they just want to see uh, other things. Also. Right. Yeah, so yeah. the French government, they said, okay, so if we support the, the yeah. cheese makers and the farmers, it's good for them. And, also, and it's good for the tourists because the tourists can actually go out and see. So, for example, it would be good to... Uh, to, improve the roads that go out to those countryside villages so that it's easier for visitors to get out there and it's good for the local people. Uh, to see farmer, to see, yeah. <clears throat> and for the, for example, the traditional ceremony, uh, it could be interesting also for tourists or not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think like the wedding I told you I went to, I'd never seen anything like it. I yeah. mean, the, the 
<laughs> I just thought, oh my gosh, they have to change their clothes so many times, <laughs> you know. But I mean, that seems like a normal thing if you're a Khmer. That's just what you do. But for an outsider, you look at that and you think, well, that's really different. So that kind of thing. And another thing that that is um, in interesting are things that happen at pagodas. You know, to go and get a monk blessing. Uh, you know, we don't have that in our country. So if if we come here and we can experience a monk blessing ourselves. Um, that's a that's a fabulous experience. So it might seem simple to a Khmer person because it's just part of the daily life, but to a visitor, that's unique, and that's what they would want to have experience. That what you told me is uh, for the daytime, for example. If uh, at the nighttime, uh, what can we do in Siem Reap, for example, or maybe the outskirts of the city? <laughs> that's a really good question, and I, I have to confess, I'm not a big nightlife person. I, I, you know, when I was younger, maybe, but now I don't so much. But, you know, uh, when when visitors come to Siem Reap, the, the nightlife that most of them already know about is Pub Street, right? Everybody knows Pub Street. What they don't know is that there's a lot of interesting spots that are opening up in different areas around town. So you have what you know they're calling the Wat Bo community, and you have uh, you know the new. Sort what of, what it has at the uh, Wat Bo community, for well, example? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there there's some really interesting uh, pubs, uh, cocktail spots, restaurants. Um, some shops are opening up there. So you know that's that's kind of like for the person that wants nightlife, but they don't want the overwhelming maybe nightlife of Pub Street. They might go to Street 26 and to Wat Bo neighborhood and. Go to places like Stewart on 26 or Miss Wong or something like that, and they can have a, a more unique nightlife. There's a, some of the tour companies do uh, foodie tours at night, so you have Taste Siem Reap or Adventures Cambodia that does foodie tours on a Vespa. I mean, I think that's a unique way to spend an evening in Siem Reap that's not just a bar on Pub Street. Um, Far Circus, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, we need to come. Yes. Uh, well, there's so there are, Far Circus. Uh, you have many program at night. Or? Well, our our main show is 8 p.m. every night. So we have a street food experience before that for a couple hours. People can in, go in the court of uh, Far Circus. Yeah, you know, we we used to have just like a normal restaurant, sit down restaurant uh, type okay, thing. But okay. during COVID, we we started to think, well, what what do local people and expats Enjoy for a dining experience, and I thought, okay, well, street food. So we talked to our our service provider, and we said, can you do this? Could you set up some booths around different spots around the cafe area, where the visitors can kind of go, you know, okay. like they would at a, a, a night market or a street food place. So it was so popular, we kept it, and okay. it's been really popular with visitors because they can maybe they feel nervous to go to a real street food night market, but. They're okay there because they they feel they're in their comfort zone. So we have that, but there's other really great night performances that people can see. Like people should absolutely see an Apsara show. I mean that's a classic traditional uh, performing arts, and you know the Apsara Theater over there uh, in that the. I think it's. Or the, maybe uh, Khmer <coughs> martial art uh, such as Kun <coughs> Lebok Sure, something. sure, yeah. and. Uh, Bamboo stage, I think, is is Bamboo stage, yeah. with the shadow puppet and stuff like that. Uh, puppet, yeah. So there's all kinds of things to do at night. Yeah, for every age group. I mean, you don't, you know, if you're a party person, then go to Pub Street. If you want something a little bit more subdued, go to Wat Bo area. If you want okay. live performances, you've got Far Circus, Upsara Theater, all kinds of stuff. Okay, my last question to you, Craig. Uh, uh, people always say that when they come to Siem Reap. Siem Reap is the place where it could bring tourism, bring us to the past a thousand years ago and to the modernity. It means a crossroad between the past and the present, or maybe the future. What what do you think of? I you know the when I think as a visitor, somebody from another country, the first thing because of it's the only thing they know is the historical culture. Um, where I think Khmer artists are playing a role is they're taking uh, creativity and creating a more modern kind of art form, and I think that can be, if if you're a traditional person, I, I think there there's a feeling here that people want to preserve the traditional culture, which is very important. But the more that we, the more that artistics art artists 
the more the artists have the freedom to create, then you go into a new, completely different kind of uh, mindset or, or, you know, and I, I think Cambodians have such a long history of art and culture. It's a very natural progression to take it into to modern art forms. Uh, I think they moved to Phnom Penh. The um, new Cambodian artists are contemporary dancers. I mean, that's a, a new modern contemporary art form. I, th I, I am not a fan. I guess this is maybe my own personal bias. Yeah. I, I want. I think it's much more interesting to let Cambodia be Cambodia. I I wouldn't. What do you mean? Uh, let Cam Cambodian uh, be Cambodian. I think sometimes people push modernization for the sake of modernization. Okay. You know, not that it really necessarily makes sense. Okay. Um, but because that's just what some people think should happen, and you know, <laughs> I'm I'm not young. School was a long time ago, but there was <laughs> there was something that stuck with me on this topic of yeah. development. Yeah. Um, how they, they, there was a study in a, a developing country that was primarily agriculture, so there are some parallels. Mm -hmm. And they said, how can we modernize it? How yeah. can we? Yeah, okay. So they thought, okay, well, let's introduce tractors and yeah. farm equipment. Well, the problem with that is nobody has money to yeah. buy it. Yeah. So then you, but what they have is a lot of yeah. labor. They have a lot of farmers. Yeah. But the, now they're replacing farmers with machines. Yeah. So that's not good. Yeah. So I think here, uh, let it evolve. Okay. I, I think, you know, the contemporary culture is happening. Okay. Um, infrastructure could benefit from more modernization. It would be great to have like a, a light rail from here to Phnom Penh. That would really help visitors yeah. get back and forth. Just to be uh, concise a little bit, maybe my question was mm, not uh, very uh, appropriate to your answer. <laughs> And my, my, my question was that, for example, when tourists come here, they feel, okay, they went to the past uh, thousand years ago, and then they can experience nightlife at Pop Street uh, as a modernity. So it means across, uh, when they come here, they experience both things, uh, the past and the present. So that idea, you think it's, uh, yes, uh, you, you agree with that idea with uh, tourists? There is a wide <coughs> variety of experiences available here, and it can be from nature to arts and culture, to food, to, to nightlife. History. Yeah, nightlife. Um, you know, another thing that's really popular here are spas because they can get, people can get excellent quality spa at a fraction of the price they're going to pay in their home country. And it, it will be the top level experience that you would get anywhere. Um, hotels, you have such a wide variety okay. from, you know, small from, boutique hotels to very contemporary. Uh, from traditional to modernity. Yeah, you have very yeah. contemporary, like Park Hyatt is, you know, okay. super contemporary. Um, yeah, so there is a wide range. Uh, so to end up, it means Siem Reap is the place uh, where the modernity and the past uh, cross together. Absolutely. I, I think visitors should... Uh, allow themselves enough time here to experience both. You know, if you're only going to come here for two days, you're going to miss it all. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Craig, uh, for your inside, <laughs> insightful uh, idea. Thank you so much. And thank you for thank, giving me the opportunity you. to talk about it. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> thank Craig. You. Uh, thank you.